And now, a moment from the Occulture Archives. Episode 17, Douglas Rushkoff in Alistair vs. Adolf. <laughs> It's really, really tricky to be a magical, spiritual, transcending being without violating a lot of the the social norms of the time that you live in. But no, I don't I don't think he was, you know, the wickedest man alive. I think he was very much trying to distinguish between black magic and white magic, between, you know, productive and destructive activities. I just think that he was, you know, he was so committed in some ways to his uh, personal growth or elevation and deeply involved in in drugs and altered states that I think it just made him, you know, less responsible maybe than he should have been. From the Kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O Culture, where the Babylon working is simply a metaphor for channeling the divine feminine within yourself. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for hanging. You picked a good time to hit the old play button because we're having ourselves a foursome for the first time. Eric Davis, Miguel Connor, and Jeff Wolf are all in the house. The basis for this chat is a couple pieces of writing Eric has done on Jack Parsons and what he calls Parsons' magical feminism. Eric, of course, is a scholar, journalist, and public speaker best known for his cultural analysis and creative explorations of esoteric mysticism. He's written about music, art, film, pop culture, and technology for Spin, Details, Rolling Stone, and Wired magazines. I invited Eric onto the show to talk about those Parsons articles and was planning to tackle this show solo. I even reread Eric's book, Technosis, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year in preparation for this, because I did want to pull some ideas out of that too. And the more I got into that book, and the more I got into Parsons and Babylon and magical feminism, the more that this pairing that you're about to hear just made sense. I know Jeff is a mark for Eric's work, Miguel is as well, in addition to being one of today's preeminent Gnostic thinkers, and they both brought unique perspectives to this chat. This is really the three of us tag-teaming Eric, and it's one of the better episodes I think we've been able to put together here. I do want to let you know that after the chat, in the outro, there's a contest for anyone who wants a chance to win a free copy of Eric's book, Technosis. I also have some t-shirt news, so please do stay tuned for that. But I gotta check this before I wreck this, so let's begin by casting this pot off deep into the existential heart of the underground, where the current state is a disunion that looks, feels, and smells a lot more like dick than some would like to admit. Enjoy! So, let's do some quick introductions here, as if any of you need them. Uh, We'll start with uh, Jeff Wolf. Uh, Jeff, you've been here twice before as a guest. You blog at secrettransmissions.com. Thanks for being here, man. Thank you very much for having me. No problem, man. And then uh, the god above god himself, host of Aeon Byte, Gnostic Radio, author and blogger as well, Mr. Connor, thank you for being here. Uh, Thank you for having me. I really admire the work you're doing, Ryan. I think you're killing it with your podcast. Obviously, I love the work Jeff does, and Eric, I I can never get enough of his writing and so forth. So this is is great company. Uh, Hopefully, we'll create an egregore for all time's (laughs) sake, or at least, (laughs) at, at the very least, not screw things up too much. I'm sure we'll do some sort of damage here for sure. And then, of course, Eric Davis, who was really why we're all here, host of the Expanding Mind podcast, author as well. Eric, thanks for being here. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm delighted. Yeah, I think I can speak for Jeff and Miguel as well, that we're all pretty delighted to be here. So we're actually here to talk about a few things. And I'd like to start with some recent writings that you've done on Jack Parsons. Uh, He's a guy who's popped 
up in conversation on this podcast before, but we've not really dug into his life and his work yet. And we do have some specific points that we want to touch on. But before we do, if you don't mind, Eric, could you give us just a brief recap of who Parsons was and also why you've been writing about him lately? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, as a as a Californian and a, a a fan of Californiana, especially occult and mystical stuff, but really just fascinated with the whole bizarre phenomena that uh, shaped me. I grew up here, and and a lot of my work, even though it doesn't necessarily look like it's stamped, you know, about California, a lot of it really is reflections on technology, popular culture, drug culture, you know, the, the freaks and the nuts and the queers and the reaction to all that. And, and so I see a lot of things. And even as I get older, I'm more and more aware of how I see things kind of it almost intentionally, almost as a way to kind of ground myself in this crazy age we're in by by sort of identifying with and knowing about the place I live and the, the place that shaped me. Uh, and so, you know, really almost of all, of all the stories in California esoteric lore, there, there's none that is, is more bizarre in some ways than Jack Parsons' story. I don't know, actually, maybe bizarre isn't the right word, but the one that's almost like the point I make in one of my essays is that if you just told Jack Parsons' life as if it were a fiction, people would go, nah, that's not really believable. That's too... That's too perfect. That's too like, you know, like a cheap pulp idea that you would have this guy who grows up a wealthy family in Pasadena. His father passes away, raised by his mom and grandma. He's a bookish child, uh, fascinated with uh, magic and sorcery, tries to call up the devil when he's 13 years old, becomes friends with this guy named Ed Foreman. They start screwing around with with uh, pa- black powder. You know, they're like blow- blowing up things and starting to make rockets and rockets in the night. The thing about it's funny, we talk about like, oh, it's, it's not rocket science. Well, rocket science wasn't always rocket science. In the as late as the 1930s, a lot of scientists, serious scientists thought that sending rockets into space was impossible. And so the enthusiasm for rocketry around the world was largely carried by sort of young fan geek societies, you know, people who were into uh, science fiction or ham radio, it was that, that kind of vibe uh, for the most part. And uh, Parsons and, and and Foreman were like the, these kind of dudes, you know, making their own rockets and blowing stuff up, sometimes kind of quite dangerously. And uh, they were doing this totally outside of any kind of university system or anything. They were just on their own. And then they met this guy named Frank Molina, who was a, a student over at Caltech. And they became friends. And, and he also was interested in rockets. And so they formed a society that kind of using some of Caltech's resources. And at some point, they were actually on on site until they so many wayward explosions went off that they banned them from campus. But what happens then is that is that, you know, Frank Molina kind of brings in the institutional side of science, which uh, was a bit. You know, a BFD in Southern California in the 1930s and 40s, the aerospace music, uh, industry is already getting going. But what it turns out is this group of, of, of Caltech and outsider rocket enthusiasts ends up the seed crystal for JPL and indeed part of the whole Southern California explosion of aerospace, uh, you know, following during and following World War II, which was, you know, had enormous consequences for the culture of California and, and all sorts of things. You know, a lot of the, you know, cool stuff that greasy kid stuff that comes out of California, like like uh, fiberglass surfboards, like those are made by people who worked in these industries who had access to these then rather exotic materials. So there's a lot of connections between California culture and these the aerospace industry. And But Parsons is the most bizarre because as uh, their their working group be- starts to have real successes and they start to make various devices for the war effort during World War II, is particularly these things called JATOs, which were essentially little rockets that you could put onto a plane that would enable it to uh, you know, achieve enough velocity to take off in a relatively small aircraft carrier. Uh, so they were very useful for the Pacific Theater, and, and this working group at, at now at part of Caltech you know, provided these things. So you know, by the 1940s, this is a successful group. It's already going to go on to create JPL and to create uh, aerospace industry, you know, and contribute to the aerospace industry. But meanwhile, uh, Mr. Parsons had discovered the work of uh, Alistair Crowley. A nice little detail, the kind of detail that really makes me gleeful, is that he uh, discovered his first Crowley book, whose name is now 
escaping me. But the first his first exposure was with a, the book collection of a used car dealer, you know, which I think is beautiful. So he said, hey, this is great. I like this stuff. He found out that there was a chapter, the OTO, uh, the Agape Lodge, number one, in uh, Hollywood. So he started to check check it out and became rapidly a very uh, important part of the group, which was in addition to being really in some sense the only functioning outpost of Thalema in the 1940s, which is important for us. You know, now there's, you know, Al- Alistair Crowley's thumbprint, greasy thumbprint is on almost every artifact of modern occulture. I mean, less so now than, than 20 years ago, but his influence was so pervasive in the occult revival of the 1970s that it's hard to imagine that in the 1940s, it was really pretty pretty much nader time, except for the Agape Lodge, uh, with some other exceptions. I mean, it's a very, you can go deep, deep into the details with Thalamic historians, and I am not one. But in any case, so Parson kind of rises in the, in the lodge, eventually becomes head of the lodge, and during this time commits these things that, again, if you wrote them down as a piece of fiction, people would go, oh, come on, that's that's too unbelievable. That's ridiculous. You know, including things like, you know, he meets a young L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard, he invites to live at his his mansion, where which is kind of a rooming house for bohemians and weirdos. And, you know, it's already kind of a free love scene and people are swapping girlfriends and wives and Parsons muscles in on, I mean, Hubbard's muscles, muscles in on Parsons' lady and then that breaks them up and then they're doing, uh, you know, higher level uh, sexual magic rites, uh, upper level OTO degrees. Parsons is going out into the desert. And apparently there was a particular area of the Mojave Desert where two power lines crossed. And Parsons found this to be a real powerful spot where he would do uh, some of his uh, outdoor rituals itself. Again, one of these symbols, again, like like something you'd read in a, in a fiction where the novelist was trying to say, wow, you know, here's this guy, he's like bridging the archaic pre-modern world of magical practice with the modern world of rocketry and transmission lines and electromagnetism. So, oh yeah, I'll have him, I'll have him do this at the crossing of, of two transmission lines in the Mojave Desert, which people still aren't sure where, where it is. There's debate. People have tried to find out where this spot was, but it's just beautiful because it's even more beautiful because it's true. And and one of these rituals, he contacts this the spirit Babylon, which was Crowley's own kind of reframing of a whole lore associated with the biblical figure of Babylon, but then getting a sort of thalamic twist and a, a name cha- a slight spelling name change, but a very important figure in Thalema, and what I argue is an extremely important figure for Parsons, whose own kind of relationship with the magical feminine can be seen on the one hand, and this is what one of my essays that you guys have read is about, on the one hand, his relationship with the magical feminine is kind of the classic sort of, you know, horny, bohemian, polyamorous, uh, you know, he wants the sort of wild woman who's almost an animal with her like unleashed desire. And, you know, he was very into that kind of archetype of the sort of extreme uh, feral female who was sort of liberated. But that in that liberation was something much more interesting. And that's what I was trying to tease out is it wasn't just a kind of cartoon fantasy of a, of a you know, wild pagan sort of seductor. But it was actually also a way to to begin to imagine something like female empowerment and indeed a kind of feminist witchcraft. And some of uh, of Parsons' ideas, I, I think in a way that hasn't been appreciated, really look forward to some of the feminist transformations of, of witchcraft, some of which took place in Southern California, you know, later on in the, in the 60s and 70s, a kind of feminist libertarian unleashing of desire and sexual power. So his whole relationship with women and, and um, eroticism and this Babylon current, this current of the sort of sacred whore uh, which gets transformed in really fascinating, brilliant ways by by Crowley and then by people following Crowley, I think is really, you know, a key part of the story. But just to sort of wrap it up here, Parsons gets eventually, because of his wild ways, which had more to do with his probably libertine sexuality and his curious politics, which veered between some socialism and libertarianism, eventually got kicked out of his uh, uh, various uh, official roles and it wasn't making money from the aerospace museum anymore, it was kind of kept by the wayside and indeed to a large extent written out of formal histories of this period. If you go into science, his, science and technology histories, you'll, you'll often see no mention of him, even though both Frank Molina and the, their head teacher at Caltech 
were always very insistent that Jack Parsons was absolutely key to not just the energy behind the group, but some of its core innovations, particularly the invention of solid rocket fuel, because at that point it was all liquid and there were problems associated with liquid. And he came up with a way to suspend it in kind of a solid form that enabled, uh, that actually unleashed a great deal of rocket power. And so this conjunction of science and magic is fascinating. You know, he would he would intone Crowley's hymn to Pan at rocket launchings and, you know, on the base, you know, he'd be like jumping up and down as, you know, doing this like thalamic chants and stuff. And so that that mix, okay, he could only maintain it for so long and he got kicked, he left the lodge and he you know, kind of went a little crazy to judge from his, his his writings, he's, uh, his relationship with Cameron, who is this very powerful um, figure in his life, his, his own kind of scarlet woman who was a redhead, uh, and a very powerful woman in her own right, went on to do amazing uh, art, and uh, her story is another story, but a fascinating one. Anyway, their relationship wasn't so good. Just about the time he looks like he's going to go and move, maybe go to Mexico. He was doing something with Israel, not really clear. There's some conspiracy theory here. He mysteriously blows himself up uh, in his lab, and he lived for a, a couple of hours, and uh, shortly after his death, his, his mother killed herself as well, which tells you something. And, you know, the, sort of thereby kind of ending this uh, this sort of James Dean-like cult life that somehow incredibly bizarrely and wonderfully fused these two very different sides of Southern California culture, this sort of exploding technological aerospace, uh, military kind of, you know, creativity, and, and on the other side, a, a sort of very underground, esoteric, erotically charged and, and wayward even subculture of, of that really, really anticipates in many ways a lot of the transformations uh, that we see a decade later with the explosion of the of the counterculture, which, you know, in many ways we can kind of see Crowley as the one of the great prophets of the youth rebellion in the in the 60s and 70s. Anyway, I think that's a little, uh, there's, there's your thumbnail sketch a little bit longer than you probably wanted, but that's Jack Parsons. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Man. Thanks. Thanks for going on that. I've spent several hours reading Parsons biographies and shit, you just did it in 10 minutes. So that's perfect. I would have one quick follow up to that. As somebody who grew up in California, you know, how prevalent or prominent was this Parsons story back when you were growing up? Because it, it just seems like in the last, I don't know, maybe 10 to 15 years, the story's become increasingly popular in the alternative community. And now, you know, Parsons has a TV show based on him, I think based on the uh, Strange Angel biography. That's coming out sometime soon, I think, this year, maybe. So I was just curious, you know, when did you first discover this story? Like, is it a well-known story out where you live? Well, I, I'm glad you asked that, actually, because it was very underground for many years until Sex and Rockets, the first biography by the pseudonymous John Carter, came out. And I can't remember exactly when that was. I believe it was the late 90s, mid 90s, somewhere around there, uh, maybe late 90s, maybe even early 2000s. And But I, ha I had actually heard of him before because of an article written by a very strange, not, not un L. Ron Hubbard-ish guy named Adam Rossacker, I think is how you pronounce his last name, who nobody knows about, but he wrote he was a pagan and a wild man he was a short red head with a you know a very charismatic personality who was known among other things uh i mean he was a i think a you know somewhat powerful magician in a certain sense but he was best known for for sleeping with other people's wives because he had that strange kind or, or girlfriends or whatever he had that strange kind of charisma that that some of these guys have. And that was definitely one of his uh, core goals in life. But he was a brilliant dude. And I met him a few times. And he wrote a, a piece about, pretty thorough piece about Parsons in Green Egg Magazine, you know, which was the pretty much the, the, the preeminent pagan underground publication from the 1970s forward, kind of the clearinghouse of a lot of smaller uh, pagan uh, publications, but had really great articles. And uh, his was about, you know, partly about, you know, sexual libertarianism. So it was, it was the politics as well as the occult story. Anyway, I was fascinated by this. Uh, Adam was later found murdered in, I think, in Sonoma County, or at least uh, north of the Bay. And it's, it was never solved. Uh, and it was almost certainly a pissed off <laughs> dude. So uh, he was a little, he was a bit of a wild man. So I actually kind of liked that there was this sort of earlier moment of exposure, even though I didn't do anything with the research. And, you know, I read the same bio biographies you did. 
as they uh, came out. And, you know, in a way that the biographies were so thorough, there really wasn't that much more to do writing wise in terms of, you know, just telling the story. It's, you know, it was all over the occult. There's a lot of other versions of it uh, in, in various occult publications that are smaller than those, but also have, you know, pieces of the puzzle. But when I went to school, I back to university recently, relatively recently, you know, I went, well, this is great stuff to kind of think about, you know, to, to, to sort of analyze a little bit more. And so I ended up writing one scholarly piece about how Parsons conceived of the relationship between magic and science. I mean, here's this guy who's like right at the heart of two very different ways of thinking about causality, about the world. How did he connect them and how did he distinguish them? And these were very interesting questions, not just in his case, but because there's a, a very ex extremely extensive and pretty interesting literature in the history of anthropology, especially, but other related disciplines about how do you distinguish magic and science? Like they're very different things for us, although obviously they're related. And there's a lot of different theories about it. We could talk about those a little bit, about how you think about that relationship. And it's often sort of triangulated with religion. There's like magic, there's science, there's religion. And these were very important categories for people thinking about the differences between modern Western people and indigenous people and people in Africa or whatever. These were like crucial categories to distinguish the West from everybody else. And then here you have this. But then there's the problem. What do we do with Westerners, modern Westerners, technological Westerners, people who understand science and technology, who nonetheless turn to the occult and don't necessarily see it as the same thing, but then come up with the relations between them? It's a fascinating question and one that's really at the heart of modern paganism in a lot of ways, to use a term that people don't use maybe not as, as much as they used to, but to, to look at not just ceremonial magic, but the sort of broader pagan environment, people, you know, returning to older ways. A lot of them were, are, you know, especially in the 60s and 70s, but, you know, to today as well, were, you know, worked in the computer industry, worked with computers, worked in technical fields, you know, worked in science labs and technolo technology labs. So there's a very interesting connection between science and magic or tech science, technology and magic. And so it's that was the main thing that I wanted to, to write about. It was a total blast. It was a really, really fun way to, to think about those issues. And then after that, I had some additional material that I was interested in that took the form of another essay that came out in a, in a collection on Three Hands Press, a, a magical publisher about uh, about Babylon and the Babylon current in Thelema. And, and that in that piece, I, I wrote about Parsons' relationship with the sort of sacred feminine and the sacred whore and how that was reflected in his own fantasy life and in his own, his own personal relationships, as well as his kind of attempt to reframe Crowley's Babylon figure. So those, that was sort of how I kind of came to write, you know, spend more time uh, with Parsons. And it was a lot of fun because nobody really writes about him in, in, in academia. So it was virgin territory. Now, since we're on that topic of Babylon, I was wondering, how did Crowley see Babylon from a biblical perspective, and how did he then reintroduce her into Thelema in a way that Parsons and other people would begin to engage with this entity? And even now, this reemergent interest in, in Babylon, what's the connection between the, the biblical figure and the magical figure? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Well, we meet Babylon with the why. In the book of Revelation, you know, the, the craziest ass book of the Bible, the book that when they put together the New Testament, you know, and they decided what's heretical and what's canonical, what's what are, are is going to be the Bible. A lot of people were not into the book of Revelation because there were lots of texts like this. These are the crazy prophetic visionary texts where they're seeing the future. There's monsters and battles in the heaven and, you know, all this kind of crazy visionary stuff. People were not that a lot of people weren't, weren't that interested in the book of Revelation. They thought it was a little dangerous. Dangerous. In some ways, it was dangerous because it, it allowed future prophets and heretics and rabble rousers and crazy fools to sort of bring their Christianity into this into a hot boil. And Babylon is one of the figures we meet in the Book of Revelation, and you know she sort of represents the sinful secular city, the sort of city, the decadent city of of worldly power and worldly luxury. So she's associated really with the urban. So Babylon is the sort of great ancient city, the great pagan city. And so from this kind of 
Christian political perspective, it's sort of the, the, the decadence of power, of worldly power. And what Crowley does then is sort of embrace that figure, underscore her erotic side, and then transform her in this, to my mind, brilliant way into almost a kind of bodhisattva of, of experience in the sense that the traditional way of looking at the whore from a Christian moralistic perspective is, of course, what makes the whore gross is that she opens herself to whoever comes. She, she, she allows the most private you know, part of, the, of, of someone's life, uh, sexual intimacy, to be bought and sold. Of course, that wasn't how the ancient world saw it. You know, it, the, in Babylon, there were temple whores, and they were not seen as gross or, or outcasts. They were, it was a legitimate position in society and that part of the practice of coming to the temple and, you know, probably partially to get, you know, get people to come to the temple is that you had this, you know, the option of, a, of an evening with a, with a sacred prostitute. So, I mean, there's a lot to say about how that typical Christian idea is flawed, though it's, it's, you can't deny that it's got some truth to it just because of the way that the, the prostitutes are treated, in, at least in modern society. In any case, what Crowley sort of did is to see this figure almost as like a, a bodhisattva who gives to everyone. I mean, what makes Babylon now with an A instead of a Y, what makes Babylon Babylon is that she is giving to all. She gives pleasure and eros to all that w- without judgment. So it's this str- almost bodhisattva, literally like a bodhisattva idea translated into this figure that's associated with sinfulness and decadence and indulgence and luxury and all that. And so it's a very brilliant, extremely Crowleyan kind of thing where there's, an, there's a thread of, of a sort of Eastern non-dualism, but it manifests in this kind of erotically charged, you know, sense, sense forward, occult transformation of energies. You know, and then that's so, so that's sort of the main, I think, the, the most important part of it. And it, it plays important roles in, in the vision and the voice of so some of his, high, you know, higher mystical experiences using a Nokian language. And indeed, the respelling of the name Babylon has to do with numerological reasons. So it's an important figure for Crowley's kind of esoteric system. And she, you know, plays a kind of like a higher initi- initiatrix role in Thelema. And, you know, you can almost see her as like a Sophia figure to some degree in, in terms of the, of the Gnosticisms, though obviously a very eroticized Sophia figure. But Parsons goes farther and he tries to kind of even put her higher up on the pedestal and, and sort of centralize her in his in his view, that was the most important current, whereas for Crowley, there was a sort of, you know, she was always in relationship with other figures and other domains of consciousness. And, you know, there is still this this strong whiff of exploitative sexism and, and misogyny in in Crowley. You know, he's a complicated figure. It's not a black and white situation, but there's definitely those elements. Certainly many people see those. And you can see a little bit of that in how Babylon gets treated, even though she's sort of sacralized in this interesting way. So in some ways, uh, Parsons tried to complete or or transform Babylon and to make her, you know, the voice of the fourth chapter of the book of the law. That's one of Parsons' great failures was an attempt to add a chapter to the book of the law and claim his own Babylon experience as a as a revelation worthy of the highest, you know, honoring. But as, as many, uh, you know, magicians point out, it's like not only was it kind of a, a ballsy move that that was questionable, but the actual text itself just can't match <laughs> Just, just can't hold a candle to uh, to, to Crowley's original uh, channeled writing, or however you want to see it. It's, it's not a very powerful piece of magical writing, although it has some great lines in it. It's certainly fascinating. So it's hard. What basically what I was arguing is that even though Parsons is not really taken that seriously in a lot of ways by contemporary occultists or magicians, you know, people working with within Thelema. I mean, sort of an interesting character, did some cool stuff, but definitely, you know, moved too fast, too far, was too arrogant, didn't really follow protocol, like, you know, declared himself a, a, a master of the temple before he really, you know, without reason, etc. I still think that he saw something coming. I think he saw something in Crowley's Babylon that was going to look forward to a, a moment, maybe a future, although today it doesn't look as good as it did in the 1970s, but a moment when, you know, an occult, empowered, inflamed 
women, feminist, libertarian, maybe man-hating, who cares, are, are they were, that there was going to be a moment where that was going to be a dominant tone, a, a possibility, a, a place, a, a kind of existential spiritual domain that would, un, would, that would unfold, and it would unfold, at least as Parsons saw it, as part of a larger project of human freedom that he saw in a kind of libertarian sense where the individual was able to kind of do what they will, you know, and just that's it, including women. And if that meant whatever, certain kind of uh, attacks on men or, or a certain degree of violence, you know, some of his images of, of the of the kind of radical witch uh, have violence in them. And indeed, part of 70s, the, the mo- some of the most powerful parts of 70s feminism involve a, a sort of violence, including violence against rapists and et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, a kind of invocation of a martial quality to the image of the sacred feminine. That's something that, that, that Crowley didn't really do, little bits of it. But for, for Parsons, it's very much a martial figure. And I think that's very powerful. We, we live in that now. You know, we, we love Scarlett Johansson kicking the shit out of people. We love Wonder Woman. We love the, the powerful kick-ass female thing. And I mean, we being men, women, pagans, normal people, there's a sort of space for the, the martial, empowered feminine that's a very powerful figure that I thought that I think Parsons was kind of prophetically anticipating, at least in terms of magical culture. Hi, Eric. This is uh, Miguel here. I have a question continuing with our discussion about Babylon. Surprising nobody, I'm going to go with uh, the Gnostic stance on this. And uh, this is something that has been brought up by researchers. I, I read it, especially people who are into Thelema. Tobias Churton has uh, toyed with this. And this is the idea that Babylon is more related to the Gnostic Barbello. And it seems, well, at first, well, she's sort of the separated, high-up, divine feminine, but... As Epiphanius said, the name for Barbello was also Pronikos, which in Greek means the wild one, the slutty woman. She was uh, the alter ego of uh, Barbello, and uh, we know that the Barbellites who uh, who revered Barbello were maybe the source for the Gnostic mass because of their alleged ideas on all these, you might say, tawdry rituals of exchanging bodily fluids and all that. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, surprising no one, including myself, uh, that's a a very perceptive comment. I did not know about that rival translation, but I do agree with you that the the Barbello figure seems quite apropos there. I don't know enough about the historical details to have an opinion about the origins of of the the Gnostic mass and the whole notion of a of a of a mass that had an, has an erotic dimension i mean obviously there's going to be s- tons of sources for sexual magic and sexual ritual in all cultures so you wouldn't want to you know, lay it all on one source but in terms of there being some kind of a feminine figure that is not strictly uh, limited to the sophia that has a, a a higher claim if you will but but is still independent and that that infuses ritual practices that have a, an erotic dimension, that totally makes sense to me. Let me talk a little bit more about, you know, as you as you look at all the different varieties of, of Gnostic cosmology, do you see a particular sort of proto-feminism, I'll say, in, in, the, in the framing of, of Barbello in particular? That's hard to say. I, it's hard to think like they did. I always don't try to. I try not to make that mistake. But they definitely do so. They definitely do so. Uh, definitely a reverence to the divine feminine, but it's very multidimensional. Again, when you, it's not as cut. It's not as simple as uh, Sophia or Barbello. In their text, they definitely have the divine feminine is multidimensional. And, for example, the Nos- the Valentinians talked about a higher Sophia and the lower Sophia, which is Akamoth, which is the wisdom of death. And she's, I guess, we could relate her to the, the martial divine feminine. She's sort of the, the warrior woman, but she's also neurotic. She's a predator. And ultimately, she's very destructive. In other texts, I think Irenaeus talks about how she actually calls Sophia the lower Sophia Terra in Latin, which means Gaia in uh, Greek. So she is the earth. And of course, uh, John Lamb Lash has taken all that and, and ran with that idea. But as far as uh, I would say, and as I've said before, and this is from uh, scholars like Nicola Denze Luz, the Gnostics were very egalitarian, radical feminists, even for today's standards. But ultimately, it was all about transcending the 
transcending the genders, if you would, even if you needed in some other sex to create these rituals of man and woman and make the make the mundane into holy to make the to glorify our animal instinct into something higher so yeah it's a complex question and it's always hard to say because so many different sects had uh, different degrees of how they saw these things but they were definitely very progressive were there times and as i say they would be very progressive for 80 percent of the world don't you think yeah yeah absolutely absolutely i mean even just to even just to reframe these re- these relationships and obviously anytime you're you're talking about maps of the heavens or of uh, different figures and the relationship between these different figures that you're you're you know you're also kind of mapping real social relations so if you have these higher sophias you know where it's not just the you know, because there's a there's a tendency, and that's kind of what I, what interests me about the Marshall Babylon is that there's a tendency. You know, there's there's always that kind of Earth Mama archetype. It's almost like a tractor, <laughs> yeah. thing, where like once you start talking about the divine feminine, and this is true for men and women, or feminist cultures and traditional cultures or whatever. That okay, there's a lot of power there. The embodiment, sensuality, knowledge of herbs, knowledge of the body, of birth and death, and all of this sort of zone that can be associated with women is like the the source of their power. And so then there's this kind of divine, this this sense of the divine female archetype as being, you know, here we are, four guys talking about this, but as being associated (laughs) with, uh, with nature. But then there's this other, like, well, what about all the higher beings? And like, what are we saying that like women, women get nature. And then once we're talking about what other altered states of consciousness or unitive states of consciousness or more cosmic dimensions of gods and demons and, you know, all that stuff that can't simply be located in the here and now and the body and the senses and in earth and nature. Well, what they don't, there's no, there's no women there. I mean, like, what? You know, that's crazy. So Part of what I like about the the Babylon is particularly, you know, the sort of uh, mystical dimension of her is that is that it's b- kind of both and and this this idea. I mean, I've read about the higher and lower Sophia, but can you tell me a little bit more, just because I'm always interested in this, uh, your thoughts on these things, what, what how they're conceived, like what what are the the associations of the higher and the lower Sophia? Again, it's hard. It depends on the sect. For example. We talk about the Valentinians. You have the idealized Sophia, but uh, obviously her transgression ultimately comes to a desire, uh, a certain lust that happens in the ideal world. As soon as that happens, she is split into the lower Sophia, the Akamoth, and she is the her essence is the one that's cast into the world. And obviously, as the Gnostic myths go, her passion, if you would creates she becomes pregnant with her emotions and she gives birth to the demiurge and we've got this whole mess happening here and like yano culiano said the story of sophia is actually very central it's not this sort of nice alternative christian narrative yeah yeah and that part i was familiar with the part i was trying to remember and maybe you can illuminate is that once that pro that cosmic process happens and the separation occurs and is there is there still a higher sophia or is it all fallen Yes, there is still a higher Sophia, but she, in a lot of the text, she doesn't seem to, she aids humanity with, with her information, but the lower Sophia is still working. Like if you, I think it's uh, the hypostasis of the archons or on the origins of the world, this lower Sophia actually splits into two, like Pistis and Sophia. She becomes two characters and these characters are, they're basically in this vicious fight to save the world, to uh, gather the sparks, to fight the demiurge. So it's it, it works on so many levels because, as you see, then suddenly Sophia splits again into Eve and she splits into the tree. So she's a very multidimensional, dreamlike quality. It's 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 very complex. Yes. No. That's thank. That's great to to remind us also of the more mercurial spirit that animates archetypes. You know, as soon as you start to think about God and you give them names and you ritualize them and you call on them and you develop pantheons and all that, there's this sort of tendency towards a sort of static thinking. But then whether you want to think about it historically or spiritually, there's also that spirit that moves through and and is only temporarily associated with certain figures. You know, it's like what happens when, like when Crowley, like if if you believe in the sort of archetypal, the realm of archetypal personalities, in any sense, in any in any real sense, if there's something there, what does it mean when you have somebody like Crowley kind of 
invent uh, a new image of Babylon. And then, you know, taking this ancient archetype that's been animating, you know, Christian readers for 2000 years in a certain way, and then sort of reframing it, you know, drawing from a lot of other things that people had done. But, I, you know, as far as I know, he was the one to really take that name and that particular character and, you know, reframe it in this way. Is, does the, do the archetype, does the archetypal world change? You know, it, was that always there? Was it just a, a pure creation that then becomes real only because other people, you know, give a hoot and start to ritually and imaginatively engage this figure? And then you have someone like Parsons come along and kind of change it again. You go, what, where, what is that? Where does that happen? Does it actually make a difference? And one way of thinking about it that allows for the quasi reality of these archetypes, but to also recognize their historical dimension is that they are animated by something that itself is always changing and might temporarily crystallize in this way. But to overly fetishize the crystallized form is to kind of deny the historical, but also the kind of just liquid quality of this stuff, that it's always changing and shimmering and reflecting. And so the the way you trace that Sophia archetype and, and how it takes different bodies is really quite a striking representation of that. Yeah, agreed. And of course, we're dealing with archetypes and Jung and all that, which is a whole nother ball of wax. But it always reminds me that Jung did say that archetypes are quasi sentient. They do have an agenda and they can actually push back in this world. So who knows what with Parsons and other figures in history, as we all know, messing with certain cosmic energies could have blowback. <laughs> That's for sure. And and would they would Crowley have said that Babylon is is speaking to him? to reinform the world about this change or is it is it the other way around where we can mutate their you know but by focusing on them with our intent they respond to us i think that's the kind of that's the 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 nub of the issue and it is it's interesting even like it's that it's kind of hard to talk about the stuff without invoking jung and like i did it simply by saying the word archetype which is like that means we're talking about jung or talking at least about <laughs> jung's ideas and, and, and so it's kind of dangerous because you might not want to actually just talk about Jung's particular ideas about the archetype. And yet it's sort of hard to come up with another language unless you just want to say gods, which is OK to just say gods, you know, the gods or this and that. And da, da, da. But it, 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 I, I think that it's that it's always important to remember the conundrum that you uh, the causal conundrum that you just raised, which is like, wait, are we talking about that? There are these forces out here that then use humans to rearticulate their form and maybe to make a new form because the people are ready for a change or they, they got it wrong in the first place. But at the same time, of course, that's also a human act of create creativity that, you know, Crowley is. A, a man who's influenced by certain things and not other things. And, and he's a creative writer and a creative psychologist and a, a, a explorer of his own mind. And he creates new frameworks, new languages, new ways of understanding it. And, and so how, where, where you put the energy, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting one. You know, some people are much more comfortable with the the human side of it, we're making these things up as we go along, which doesn't mean they don't exist. And then other people are more on the, you know, theolo theological side of it, where it's like, no, there are these external human and non-human agencies that have their own plans and plots, and that we interface with them in, in various ways. And some of that interfacing might be creative activity, but it doesn't mean that it's just the creative activity that's producing those things. And so that, that it's a very interesting relationship. And, uh, and I think ultimately, it's kind of a, you know, a non dual thing where they're both true. And you can't ultimately resolve the ontological problem one way or the other, that when you, when you produce when humans create, and do ritual and invent tell stories and draw pictures and, you know, imagine and you know, give it their desire, give it their spunk, whatever, that even if you really just emphasize that side, which is like the more conventional historical side, that something is created that has its own quality, like an egregore. I mean, in a way, we're talking about egregores, like an egregore, everyone, no one's going to say that the egregore was part of the, it's not part of like the always existent archetypal feel. The egregore is something that is constructed with human ritual, human desire, uh, groups uh, working over time, working together, et cetera, et cetera. But yet 
the egregore has a life of its own, just like corporations have a life of their own. And there's and there's a relationship between egregores and corporations. So even in our kind of secular historical sense, we have to recognize that human activity produces things, agents that then have a life of their own. So in a way, it almost doesn't really matter, which is, I think, part of the insight of a more kind of post-chaos magic way of thinking about these things, or, or really like the Alan Moore framework. I mean, this is kind of like Promethea and, and Providence. Alan Moore plays with these same ideas, that it's really just human creativity, but there's something that's produced that has its own agency, its own you know way of being, and whether or not that was always there or not, I don't know how important that is for me, but it's. I think ultimately you got to see it as a dance. Definitely. And if I could just uh, jump in here for a moment, you mentioned something related to this in the longer of your two Parsons pieces about invocating lesser forces was more scientific. And then there was an artistic way to like woo the gods. Is that kind of what we're talking about here still? Actually, I wasn't thinking about that distinction, but and I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, it's, it's such a fascinating one. It's so worth like chewing over that in Parsons view that to call on let's call them, I don't know, lower is a little mean, uh, <laughs> or more earthly, uh, more uh, demonic. I'm not really sure. Let's just go with lower for now, and, uh, and forgive me, fellows. But the um, to call on, on lower forces to create physical effects, to create phenomena, to make things, to make change happen, to basically sorcery. That, in, that sorcery for Parsons was more like technology. There were certain rules. There were certain laws of causality that the magician could control, but that in relationship to higher figures, more like gods, like we're talking about a figure like Babylon or other sort of Hermes or whoever you might want to be invoking, that there it is not purely tech. There's also a kind of poetics that it requires the sort of juiciness of art or the ambiguity or the artfulness of of, of good speech of, of beauty of of a kind of more multi-dimensional conjuring of, of affect or you know feelings and so he made a kind of you know science and technology on the one hand and sort of poetics of the human imagination on the other he made that distinction within his own model of magic I think it's very intriguing I don't I don't know how widespread that idea would be, but it's one of the ways that he tried to think technology and science within a magical framework. But what I was talking real about is really the whole thing, the whole, the whole operation of relating with non-human agents. It partly involves an element of human construction and creation, or even saying human is not even quite right because part of us is not really, you know, is are, are your are your you know the subroutines that are operating beneath a consciousness that are making decisions or biasing certain things is that human I, sort of not really kind of but there, it's something about what we do or what happens through us that's driving the event but the event itself has a, has its own kind of logic and I think that is really one of the marvelous things about the modern about modern magic is the way in which it underscores that. At least, especially in the post-chaos magic kind of articulation, but it's already in Crowley too. This idea that you know, on some level, we're acting like scientists. We're investigating phenomena. We're doing experiments. Uh, we don't have any, you know, great belief that these things are ontologically real. In fact, even that debate might be getting in the way. And yet, and yet, and yet, our experience, and then even our understanding of other people's experience seems to point to levels of agency and interaction that can't be reduced to just human projection and human storytelling. It's just, I mean, you know, hardcore people say, yes, you can do that. And that's fine. I don't, I can't, it wouldn't be accurate to my own experience. And so we're in this kind of interesting place. Like, what does it mean to say that they're always there or to say that we just created them? Or is there a middle, a middle path? Yeah, I, I kind of wanted to bounce in that same territory in your essay there. You begin to talk about Crowley's, the axiom, the method of science and the aim of religion as part of the, the Thelemic way. And and you, you talk about the, the term like esoteric science and, and that relating into, you know, we have this scientific way of reaching more material gods and, and beings. And then we have this higher, more artful, emotive way of connecting where do you kind of land in this whole science of religious experience thing? And it's one of those things about 
about magic that's always confounded me a little bit because I've just, maybe it was the way I was raised, but I always more related to the emotive, it, the mystical. And so when it starts talking about, you know, in Parsons world or the philemic world of, you know, we got to keep records and we need to uh, quantify these subjective impressions and subject them to a, a falsification process. In your reading of, of Parsons records, does that methodology bring somebody somewhere? Does it allow you to reach those higher, more mystical states? Um, mm. Is it a necessary process for mm. somebody who wants to engage with spirit? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a scientific method. Yeah, that's a, those are all really good questions. In a way, I'm gonna uh, gonna punt a little bit because I don't have a, a particularly strong sp- opinion about it overall. And so I'm just, it's kind of the lame, like, well, you know, for some people that's appropriate, for other people it's not appropriate, for some people it's productive, for other people it's not productive. And I think in a way, the more interesting question is why are certain narratives around that more or less important at any given time in in history? I mean, in many ways, ultimately, I'm kind of a cultural historian, but a, a historian who believes that there are if not trans historical forces, then there are certain things that operate at very different scales and times. So um, the door is open to not just material history, because I think it's probably always, you know, it's, there's there's always those, those elements. There's a kind of disenchanted path that tries to look uh, objectively at one's own experience, but is open to experiment. And then there's a kind of more poetic path where you sort of throw yourself or just allow for a much less predictable and controlled sort of drift or, or, or transcendence into the mystery. I mean, I think there is a mystery and that it's or many mysteries and that it's, it's important for us to acknowledge it, but there are different relations to mystery. I mean, the scientific idea is that you can learn more and maybe you keep just pushing the, the goal pole of mystery down the, down the field, but there is a kind of progressive process there. And I certainly think it's incredibly important for people who are interested in, in magic or ritual or, or really just spiritual experience to be familiar with the reductive arguments about what's going on with altered states, with visionary experience, with senses of, of the divine or unitive experiences, that it's important to be familiar enough with that to, to kind of erode your tendency towards fixed belief or towards purely personal explanations, you know, like, oh, well, that's just my experience. And I, I heard God talking to me. And that's, that's, that's all I need. I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. And you're like, okay, well, but there's other ways of thinking about it. That said, I do believe that there, there are strong limitations to that approach. I would not say that I don't think these people can reach higher mystical states because they're using sort of more disenchanted scientific ideas. I think it probably ultimately has more to do with kind of personality types and what you sort of resonate with than about your method. But I do think that there is a real problem with with having that more kind of disenchanted scientific method in matters of the spirit and, and that there's a lot of arguments there, but the core one, the one I think is most important, is that the approach of the of the scientist or the experimenter often, how to say it, it, it re-emphasizes the sense of the self as a manipulator, as some, a tool user. The idea that like the the self, the, the the exploring human, is using tools in order to do things to the environment in order to then note those things and use them as some kind of iterative process to understand more. You know, and that's sort of how science works, but it's not just science. So, you know, we live our lives that way. It's a good thing. But when you get to these higher mystical realms or you know, realms of profound encounter with non-human agencies or nature or the cosmos. When you get to those places, I think that sometimes or a lot of the time, that doer, that manipulator, that planner, that projector has to go. Uh, it has to be ready to go. So there's if you over fetishize that kind of scientific approach within the search for mystery or the exploration of the mystery. I think there's a certain part, I suspect that there's a certain part where you hit a wall because you're not undermining the doer. And, you know, I'm not going to say this is true for everyone's experience. You know, I can't claim that. It's so, things, these things get so wiggy. But I do, I do think that, that's, that it's important to also cultivate 
extreme receptivity, high poetry, high nonsense, even a little madness within that mix, or it's going to be too too dry. You know, it's even like even if you look at like Crowley, if you look at him as a art an arch magus, you know, a great a magician, a lot of whose magic is quite intentional, manipulative, if you want to say it that way, tool using, procedural, methodical. But then you have, you know, like the Enochian calls. And the Enochian calls is like once you learn the tech, once you learn the the mechanism of communication, the actual form of that magic, if you want to call it that, is pure receptivity. It's open to the images. Where do the images take you? What do, who do you see? What do they say? Can you remember it? Can you write it down? That's the most you're going to do at that point. So even if you look at someone like Crowley, who in some ways is very much the capital M magician, the, the will, decision, activity, agency, that even there, like the, the profound vision of the voice, which is you know really my one of my favorite parts of the whole, or if not that I've read all of Crowley by any means, but of the stuff that I've encountered, there you have this sort of receptivity, this sort of openness. And it's in that zone, too, where you get encounters with Babylon and such. So there's... There's some balance there that I think is really uh, important, but at the same time, different temperaments are going to lean different ways. And then you get to that other question, that great conundrum in spiritual, psycho-spiritual searching, which is that if you realize that you lean one way rather than another, do you go with the way you lean or do you consciously lean in the other direction to kind of balance or, or challenge your presuppositions? And it might be the case that sometimes on your path, you lean. And that at another point, it comes to stage when you got to like lean back, you know, and, and really resist your comfortable zone. Uh, and that might oscillate. And who knows when? And you don't know. It's a mystery. But I think that's one element that people really miss is a certain reflection on their own temperament and their own predilections. I have the tendency to be, like you say, poetic or more mystical or fuzzier. And I'm, I kind of was puzzled by this sort of more procedural, methodological approach. And yeah, you know, go with that. But there might be points when it's precisely that that you have to challenge uh, in order for whatever you want to call it, evolution or illumination to to have a place to, to sneak in. Eric, I wanted to ask you a question, and I think I've been wanting to ask you this question for quite a while. But since Babylon brought these four dudes to talk about it, I'm going to ask this question now. I uh, enjoyed your books, Technosis and Nomad Codes, books that talk about uh, the, the interplay of the digital and the occult world. But the books also talk about these pockets of esoterica that you've studied for years, from Crowley to Surfers in Goa to Philip K. Dick and all this wonderful stuff. But it seems we're in the middle of a paradigm change where the pockets of esoterica are done and the esoteric, or as you call it, the modern esoteric has completely exploded into mundane reality. It's part of our fabric, whether it's a uh, Keck and me magic, the bind the witches outside the Trump tower casting spells, Elon Musk saying that we live in a computerized world like the matrix. Alex Jones is now mainstream and he talks about archons and so forth. We got Sophia, the robot becoming a citizen of Saudi Arabia so as uh, Michael Moorcock said, we are living in a Philip K. Dick world, and it seems the old paradigm of technosis and modern esoterica is over. So what are your views now? Do you think we need a technosis 2.0? You know, I'm going to be frank and vulnerable here and say that I'm a little uh, confused more than a little confused by this I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. you. Know? We're and, trying to and, make sense of this. <laughs> and, you know, and I, that's where I kind of have to go a little a little personal. You know, I'm, I'm in my 50s and, and you know, I'm, I'm with my friends and we're getting older and we're talking about what does it mean to get, get older. And, you know, one of the weird things about getting older is you start to kind of go like, well, like the history, the historical forces that shaped me, that made me who I am are gone or going or you know, very minor or whatever. So there's this shift. But then the question of like, how does one someone like me, who is, you know, I always had fidelity first to the underground. So when I was in high school, I was, a, you know, a stoner druggie. You know, I went to a good school, I got, you know, top notch intellectual education, I was always still 
you know, a psychedelic weird guy. I was always a creature of the underground and I trust the underground. I trust the tribal values of the underground, you know, like the, the main, the, the uh, legalization of cannabis in, in my state. It's the same, you know, frigging thing. We're like, my gut is that, no, it was better before. It was actually better, even though some people went to prison and not quite so much the black and brown people were more easily uh, uh, managed. In, in some ways, I am pro-legalization, but only for that that ethical, political reason, not because I, I actually believe that it will make cannabis culture better. So that, that's kind of a different thing. But it's the same kind of point is that all of these things that shaped me, that made me an underground person, my friend networks, the texts that, that I read, the, the teachers that informed me. And so now we're in this, this other zone. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not a big fan, you know, like it doesn't, I don't really, it doesn't really jibe with me. I don't know how to deal with it. I don't know how to, you know, is, is it my job to like reframe ideas in, in a way that will communicate in the, in some kind of viral meme like fashion? Is it to build up my, my, you know, Twitter followers and by, by doing certain things and like gaming the system, everyone's gaming the system. And, and, and I really don't know. And so all I've been able to do is to continue to have conversations. That's why I do my podcast is rather I've been doing, you know, the podcast has been more important to me than my writing. And indeed, my next project, which, you know, is going to come out probably in about a year, High Weirdness, which is based on my dissertation it's not accidental it's it's about you know the 60s and 70s it's about terence mckenna philip k dick robert anton wilson and it's written with a an eye towards our current conundrum but i'm not diving into the currency because i find a lot of it really puerile and so i i don't i'm kind of stuck between like my own the, again, like the forces that shape me, the things that I have fidelity to on a deep level, my own experiences, the people that I think I've encountered, the scenes that I've been blessed to know about. And I was er so early on this shit, you know, like talking about writing about psychedelics and the occult in the early 1990s. I mean, yeah, there was a small underground of people who were into that stuff, but writing about it for the mainstream, for like, you know, New York magazines and, and the Village Voice even, nobody was doing that shit and nobody cared. And they just let me do it because they like, I was a good writer and they're like, okay, go ahead. That's kind of interesting. You know, sure. And, you know, you find, you know, there's fans or weirdos out there like tucked in these organizations. And so I've been, you know, flying the freak flag for decades. And now it's just like, it's all kind of banal and all these hucksters and people who just want to like make a mark because they're really comfortable with the hyper competitive digital whatever you want to call it like this sort of you know dog eat dog world of, of promote self-promotion and branding and personal branding and all that shit and now they're all you know they that there's so there's a million people talking about you know whatever the occult or the uh, esoteric imagination or or ayahuasca or you know, all this stuff. And there's there, there are the, the most precious qualities that I have been able to encounter in my life through, you know, friendships with people like you, being able to be a journalist and explore a lot of different places and touch in with a lot of subcultures. The, I, I've been forced to become more and more re refined about what it is that I really carry, not just that what I believe, but what I carry because of what marked me, like I have a responsibility to some extent to these things that have marked me. That's how I see it anyway. And it's not clear to me how those qualities fit. And sometimes, often, I feel like they don't and that it's the hide your light in, in the bushel time. It's the really go underground time, you know, uh, and I don't mean necessarily cease communicating or, or, you know, having conversations, public conversations like this, but almost more internally, that really, we're, we're in a kind of dark ages of light, where there's too much information, too much glare, too much attention, and everything is coming up to glare. It's like, it's like, uh, you know, the, the literal meaning of apocalypse. It's like everything is revealed. It's, there's not these secret corners anymore where you can build up an alternative identity or an alternative society, which isn't really true ultimately, because we're all part of the machine on some level. And so sometimes I go, you know, that, that those things just actually aren't really translatable. And so I'm not sure whether I don't, I don't have a technosis 2.0 in that sense, because I am I feel like I'm different in some fundamental way from a lot of younger people who are turning on to these things. Like I just have a different set of associations. I'm an analog person. 
I'm very aware of being an analog person who was always interested in the digital. As soon as I saw the first computer, I was like, whoa, this is cool. I mean, I played adventure, an early text adventure game on a deck 10 in 1976. And it was a revelation. Like, I will never forget what that opened up and being online early. And like, I've always been into it. But at core, I'm much more of an analog person. I like nature, I like face to face communication. You know, I like weed. I like books. You know, I'm not really of this thing. And so I'm flattered when people want to talk to me or that they keep listening to my podcast and that hopefully they'll some read my book. But I don't necessarily feel like I've got the goods or the personality or the attitude that would really, you know, kind of lead in this new space. And, and maybe that's a failure on my part, a failure of imagination or will. But I'm just so confused by the new and, and repulsed, re, you know, physically repulsed by a lot of the quality of this kind of information space and all the mind control and all the manipulation. And yeah, but Eric, can I stop you right there? Because yeah, yeah, please I do feel it. if anybody would have a point of reference, that would be you. Because, for example, Ryan sent me this really cool article for the Boston Review on Philip K. Dick. Yeah, he and sent me that the article. Yeah, the article says we live in Philip K. Dick's future, not George Orwell's or Aldous Huxley. We do live in Ubik. We do live in a time of surveillance, paranoia, false identities and all that. This is something you have studied probably more than anybody for years. You saw it coming and it's here. Yeah, right. I, 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 I don't know what to say. You know, it's like that's I feel bad. I feel like I'm I mean, I, I'm almost going like Woody Allen here. I'm like raising my hands. Like, I don't know. I, what? It's so confusing. Ah. You, you, you know? edited his exegesis. I mean, you, know? you distilled well, I mean, Philip K. Dick. <laughs> well, I mean, it comes down to, you know, well, one of the interesting things in that article a couple of points about the article. One thing I'm not entirely on board about is is there's the, the idea that we're not in in Huxley's dystopia because I I think that the part of part of what made Huxley's dystopia work is that hedonism is absolutely incorporated into the system maintaining itself. The example here is the feelies, you know, that you go to these, you go to a movie show and instead of just a movie, it's like a full sensory virtual experience and that people's pursuit of pleasure is absolutely degradedly woven into maintaining the system. Unlike the kind of Orwellian totalitarian control, this is totalitarian through your own pleasure. And I think that there's a very important element of that in what's going on, particularly in the people who can afford it. You know, if we look at like what's driving the haves, what's driving not just the 1%, but like the people who come into money or who are able to ride in that top tier of our, you know, just horribly dysfunctionally, you know, diversity, economically split society. Um, And there is a certain kind of like, I don't know, there's something that happened to hedonism too. It's like Burning Man, you know, like, again, it's that the new old tension, you know, Burning Man in the 90s. Yeah, it was hedonistic, but it was really edgy. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of satire, you know, a lot of sarcasm, a lot of existential play. And then you know, having gone for many, I, I stopped going about, you know, seven years ago, but even just through through the 2000s and certainly in, in following up on the, the culture, what's happening to the cultures. Yeah, those are those elements are still there. But by and large, there's been a, a, a big shift towards, you know, really, it's a place for global money. Now, you know, you have Russian oligarchs, you have people who come in and they spend huge amounts of money on art cars or whatever. And it's extremely hedonistic. And they're taking hedonistic drugs and celebrating sexuality and all that kind of stuff, which was always part of it. But it's, it's sort of changed its frame. It's kind of become this sort of like, and there's there's an aspect of capital that's trying to just produce pleasant experiences, produce senses of wholeness, of wellness. It's infected a lot of the new age, a lot of the holistic world. It's got this sort of, so it does have a Huxleyan cast. But that all said, I do agree that that we're in Philip K. Dick land in a lot of ways. And the one element that was interesting about that article, which I think in a way answers or, or reposes the question you asked me, is he, he goes, he says, well, yeah, but we're not going to get any divine inter- interventions. So it's like it's like Philip K. Dick without the possibility of transcendence. 
Now, of course, for Philip K. Dick, even the possibility of transcendence didn't really help that long because you don't really get the message right and it's garbled and you have to keep trying to interpret it and you never get an answer. So I'm not saying that the Dick's mysticism or his Gnosticism or his uh, religiosity saved him from the dark world that his fictions foresaw in, in many ways. But it does raise interesting questions for us going, well, we're in a Philip K. Dick world. If we're in a Philip K. Dick world, are we still trying to tune into the divine messages that are hidden in the, in the manipulated environment? Or do we completely submit to a kind of despair or a kind of confusion where the only options to feel good are Huxley and Feelys, where we know, like, you know, I don't know how you guys feel, but I am very aware of what's really going on when it's, you know, 8 p.m. And I'm like, well, I can smoke a bone and watch Netflix. And that's pretty degraded <laughs> feeling. But I know that I'm checking right. out because it's pretty pleasurable and I don't have to fucking deal for a couple hours. And if we're, if we're looking at the monster without the sense that there's some kind of divine intervention or possibility, whether it's a global consciousness shift or whether it's some individual experience that at least you can sh shed your share your light with your family and friends or the pocket of people you deal with, even if it's very low level that way. You know, I, I kind of have to keep that. <laughs> that has to be in the picture because without that, it just looks really depressing. So for me, it's like, yes, we're in a Philip K. Dick world, but that means that we're also in a world where these bizarre and wonderful and frightening religious and spiritual possibilities are still part of the picture. I don't know what they mean. I don't have a great faith that they're going to help us get out of the problem we're in. I don't think it's, you know, whatever. I, I'm, I'm fairly modest in my expectations here. But I do think that existentially it's, in, it's incredibly important in a way to continue to probe as a philosophical, mystical person, acknowledging the mystery, acknowledging the, 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 the there is a kind of darkness, that there are things that we can call archons, that we are trying to communicate in an increasingly, you know, in a, in a sort of sea of brainwash juices, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, but to have that kind of edge that like, we're still like, um, partisans of the spirit. And in a way that's partly comes around to the earlier question about these sort of tribal values of the underground, where I still kind of feel like there is an underground. It's just that it's not, it's not about the content. It's almost a certain sensibility, uh, almost a nameless sensibility. It's still a kind of wink, wink, where you see someone across the crowd and you can kind of tell that they're tuned in in a way that you're tuned in. And there's a way to kind of greet and, and interact in a, in a situation that's very oppressive. And, and, you know, I think a lot of like what it was like to live in, you know, Hungary in the 1960s or something where you're, you're living under this totalitarian regime where there's spies everywhere, there's snitches everywhere, the media is is manipulated. You know, if, if you get like a, you know, like you might get a, a, a cassette of, you know, uh, Jimi Hendrix's record on some, you know, fourth cop generation analog cassette, and that's like your taste of the other world. That kind of mind frame is not necessarily the worst thing to take on, at least in some parts of our of our lives. But to do that, you, you do also have to have some kind of spiritual center or, or, or a kind of commitment or awareness of your own fidelity to experiences and things that have changed you. And, and at the very least, be aware of them and, you know, continue to cultivate that as you are confronted and sort of affronted with all of these terribly challenging situations. But, but again, I think it's like, it's not about the content. It's not about the content. It's not about the, the, the things you see or the memes that can be redeployed. There's some other element there. There's some other overtone of the process that I still think has a kind of tribal quality or something that, that conspiracy of, uh, of anti-conspiracies or something. I don't know. It's, it's tough to language the place we're at. Eric, like everything that you documented in, in the technosis that you're now sort of as you describe it, kind of totally disenchanted with, but like you predicted so many of these things, like you you talked about, you know, like in the net in the early days, like it was a, it was thought of to be become this people's technology. And it was had this these sixties values of like radical democracy and alternative communities, empowerment, a decentralized, kind of free flowing society. And then 
I don't know if you saw it right off the bat, but we know where we are now in the, the Philip K. Dick dystopia of what what the net is and, and all of the technology that surrounds us. Like, are we just at a point of no return? Like, have we just crossed a threshold um, where off-worlding is like the only final frontier? And like, you even talked about that in the 90s, about the singularity and looking at off-world. Did, are you surprised that, you know, we've got SpaceX and, and that that's like a serious consideration of like, where, where the fuck do we go now? Is this, wor- is this world just doomed and is our only sort of aspirational hope out there in the stars somewhere. Yeah, man, that's that's a that's a that's a real heavy question. And you know, it didn't have to be this way. It's like I've been I mean, one thing I've been I've been thinking about is going back to uh, I read some piece on Medium where where some guy who's like my my age and was a early enthusiastic techie in the '90s and he now feels ashamed. And it was writing about uh, basically it was a mea culpa. It was like, look, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that we thought this and that our blindness to the potential dark side, you know, led us to this kind of naive enthusiasm that created the structure that then is doing what what it's doing. And that's where I think it's really important to to stay on, to keep a kind of political and political economy in mind, that it's not that there was some inherent evil in bulletin boards and message systems and, you know, from the ARPANET or whatever. That's what we really do have to remember that, you know, we're we're in this hyper capitalist, post human capitalist moment. And that's one way of thinking about it is that the, the the machines, the algorithms are so bound up with how capital works and how capital conceives of itself that it's almost like we have birthed this sort of incredibly productive, creative parasite that increasingly is asking itself what it even needs us for and that's to give it some agency and so we're in this zone and and i really don't know how to respond in terms of the aspiration kind of question my aspiration personally is just to wake up as much as i can shed as much light as i can and stay true to the things that i have fidelity to which include things like experiences that not, aren't even particularly deep. Like I am not a capital M magician or, you know, a super deep. I'm, I, I have not never been in the OTO or whatever, but include sort of experiences of what that magical domain is about and that it's important to keep that conversation going and to resist the impulse to just translate it into more aggressive mimetics. I think that's, well, evil. Uh, and I'm OK with evil as a sort of small e evil as a way of navigating the kinds of conundrums that we all face. And so my, I still keep these aspirations, but I don't believe there's necessarily a ground for them. I feel actually just lucky that I have them. If I encounter people who are just operating as kind of uh, self-promoting drone brands who are exploiting all the technical tricks they can in order to advance some empty goal of something that involves power or whatever, like that kind of logic, which is so pervasive, so easy to tap into. It's not like I go, oh, you're, you're not seeing the bigger picture. It's like, I don't even know what that bigger picture is. It's so dominant. It's so, you know, it does have that too late feel to it like oops that was it up oh, too bad and i'm haunted by by that that sense and so that's kind of what i was saying about the the keeping your light in is that if we think about incredibly oppressive times like living in a totalitarian regime in the 1960s in eastern europe or pogroms in the Middle Ages, or you know, witch hunting times, or whatever, and you're the carrier of the mysteries and the the herb lore, or whatever. That you know, at some point, you, there is a kind of like keeping your light alive, and that that's may actually end up being pretty hard to do. That even if we give up on like political transformation, or that we can somehow outrun the internet, or or put a lock on these whatever AI archons that are like putting their tendrils ever more deeply into physical reality where it's not just about the internet. It's like, it's everywhere. You can't escape at any time that in that, those kinds of extreme conditions, even just staying awake 
which I don't know exactly how to define, but I, you know, let's just take it for now. It's staying awake or staying human or staying responsive, staying empathetic, staying capable of tuning into incorporeal forces to nature, to other people's emotions, whatever you want to call it. That just doing that is going to be pretty fucking hard. And it's going to be hard way harder for people who are young. And like, that's where I, I feel really hamstrung is I, I don't, if I talk to people who are familiar with my stuff and, or, or part of that kind of worldview, or certainly people in my generation, like, yeah, we'll have stuff to talk about. We'll, we'll keep our, our light alive, but how to transfer this forward when, when people young, you know, people who are just very young today don't have any of these opportunities or experiences that we've had, they have no analog, no underground, no uh, invitation to these places before they were so codified. Like, I just don't know. I don't know what to say. And that, that really grieves me. I'm not, I'm not too grieved about myself, but I'm, I'm very grieved about the future of, of human beings because I can't, I can't deny my core values and I don't see those core values reproducing in obvious ways. But I also don't know, you know, you don't know what's happening in Africa or what's happening in places that are less organized. And there's a little room maybe to maneuver where things can happen off grid or, you know, who know, you know, who knows? I mean, there's so many science fiction scenarios, but I certainly a lot of the time feel like we, we may have crossed a point of of no return. But I, I, st- I still don't know what to, what to do about that. <laughs> I wouldn't lose hope, Eric. They d- they've done research, and something that millennials really like these days is guess what? Coloring books. In other words, there's an <laughs> impulse to get off the grid. I think the impulse yeah. is there, and we will go back. What is what do they say in marketing? What is old is new. What is new is old. So if people can get back to coloring books, they might get back to reading novels or scholarly books. Why not? I, I'm hopeful a lot of the time too but but sometimes it's it's hard it's i mean i guess it's i'm just i'm i'm just flummoxed about what the practice is how to practice with this moment and i find myself and i i'm curious what you guys how you guys find yourself torn between a desire to kind of check out as much as possible to keep things alive and nurtured versus diving into the the monstrous maw uh, with some sense of a of a mission to to keep the messages going or keep the contacts open, and I and I you know I I don't know you know I kind of I'm kind of doing both you know maybe that's the best he can do, but but it's a it's a conundrum for me right now. Well, Miguel, I'm sure you see it like raising kids, like exactly what you're talking about. You see it on the ground level, you know, like what how kids experience life now from birth in the digital realm and. Uh, Like I I have exactly all that fear and existential plight that you described tenfold, not not just for me, but yeah, for my kids. And like, what, what is this reality? Like, what is their sense of realness? What is their value priorities when they're so attached to these devices and they're like, they experience so much through these devices. Like I'm, I'm in the position where like, how do I moderate this? Like, it's my, I'm, it's like my job. They're like a free agent. But I'm also like responsible to try to, like you said, carry on or transmit a truth or, or something that I like that I believe in at the core. And it's a really tricky thing to try to manage as you, you know bringing somebody into maturity on based on like what values. I hope like Miguel, like they get burned out or like they get jaded with the technology that eventually doesn't fulfill. You know, it, it stimulates on that feelies level, but like it doesn't fill that ultimate desire to connect. And I hope that they can figure that out and start to reject or turn away or start to think about like, maybe we can have another like sixties, like go back to the land kind of thing, because that's what I wish I could do. is like unplug, quit my job and like move us out to the farm. But then I realized I've been raised. I don't know shit about self-sustaining and like how to grow food and all that stuff. Yeah, well, to Eric, I'd say you can uh, check out any time you want, but you can never leave. I'll bring <laughs> I that. So, yes, you are in the welcome to the machine, my son. What did you dream? It's all right. We told you what to dream. So it's not a good, it's not a good scenario. I mean, with my younger kid, they're already plugged in. They're two, three, and they can handle a tablet. They can handle YouTube. They they jump forward 
on a computer much faster. The machine learns so much faster. They're already teaching me things, these toddlers. It's organic. It's it's part of the medium. Uh, but I guess the medium is the message. So, But I do think there is an impulse to go back to get off the grid and so forth. But at the end of the day, it is the context. If we're playing a video game, it's still the same. It's the, the hero with a thousand faces. And that's what they got to hold on to, that story, whether it's the priest or the king. There is somebody marketing you. There's somebody that wants to censor you. And there's somebody who wants to control your thoughts. I mean, uh, same as it ever was. Now I'm bringing in the talking heads and the ultimate <laughs> existentialist song. You know, but a lot of the time, it's funny for me uh, personally, just because of partly the fruits of my own, you know, practice and, and my own, uh, you know, real commitment to, you know, try to wake up in this life and try to brush off the more subtle antennae. And to tune into dimensions of reality, of nature, of the cosmos, of other people. And, you know, this was a really important part of my own search, which was kind of going on behind the scenes of my more public interests that I wrote about. And that sort of the fruition of some of those has put me in this very peculiar place where my my own experience of my life is often full of joy and full of immediacy and intimacy with the world, with nature, with other people. And yet that's happening inside this machine. And I don't have any illusions about the limits of my bubble and what's going on. And that's where a lot of, you know, new age people blow it. I mean, that's, I think, part of the function of lowbrow holistic health and wellness industry and, and yoga and all that stuff. And I'm, a, you know, I'm a yogi. I go to yoga classes, da, da, da. But part of its function is to prop up people's bubbles. But it's, you know, easy if your bubble's working to like think it's that's it. Then, you're, you know, it's just about, you know, getting tuned in and everybody can do it. I'm also very aware that I'm in the machine and the dreams are have, have unknown origins. Yeah, I don't know what to do. I mean, in a way, it's just made me more existential, like going back. Like I often feel like, the real core of a lot of spiritual, modern spiritual currents, hippies, psychedelics, magic, paganism, uh, you know, the sort of spiritual search of metaphysics in the 20th century, all that. A lot of it really has a kind of core existential quality to it uh, of not knowing of, of how do you move in a world where you don't know what's going on or you, there's no basis for authority. And a lot of what I think we're seeing now is that as people are kind of forced into an initiation into the contingency of reality that a lot of people who haven't been, you know, working on that are just react with reaction and, and refusal and, and become sort of little meme robots of, of certain currents that are being manipulated by a variety of powers for other purposes. And so we are in this kind of you know, little arms race of waking up. And in that sense, I do believe that it's important to kind of to live with contingency, to live with not knowing, to live with a kind of distrust that doesn't cut you off from from connection, from the possibility of connection, because I, it's, a, it's almost like inoculating yourself with some existentialism to be able to deal to some degree with the, the kind of things we face and not just to shut down and not just to plug into the feelies and, uh, and not just to give into despair, which is a, a failure. It's a fail to, to give into despair, even though you can see it looming in the horizon. So for me, I, I still kind of double down on on practices. And again, coming back to Philip K. Dick is that Philip K. Dick could not have foreseen what he foresaw without having some kind of religiosity or some kind of seeking that was motivating it on some level. Again, not that it saved him, not that it saves anybody, but it's it's part of the picture. It's part of where where I think we have to to live. I just want to know, Eric. I'm just curious. You know, this this whole conversation leads me to this topic. I think, but what is love, and what does it have to do with all this? Wow, that is a that is a a zinger. You know, again, sort of to speak personally, I though my my life has been I've been blessed with having many loving relationships and and friendships and and family as well. 
love has always been the the trickiest, hardest to articulate part of my kind of worldview. Not that I didn't believe in it, but but like within the sort of domains of spirituality, you know, you could talk about physical practices, practices of the body, talk about sort of mind practices or practices of meditation, of contemplation. And then there's all these practices of the heart and of relationship. And that's always been the part that's been the har- hardest for me. But the part that I think is important in terms of the questions that we've been talking about, how to move forward, you know, other than it's really important to cultivate the personal network that you can draw from. I mean, I, I can't imagine being, I mean, again, I'm blessed. What would I have done without the wonderful partners I've had and the wonderful friends that I've, I've, I've been able to have? But part of that uh, ability to do that, I think, has to do with being willing to, you know, open up to that possibility for a kind of empathetic resonance, you know, to open up for the possibility of resonance. So for me, love in some ways is the, is really what's ultimately lying, underlying my commitment to remaining open, open-minded, open to others, open to horror, open to unexpected beauty. And that when faced with difficulties, that even though I retreat and shrink back like everybody, that there's a, a, a very strong move to stay open to resonances from the outside meaning from outside my little ego game. And, you know, it might be might be an outside that's deep within, like some spiritual intu- intuition or some message in a dream. But I still think of that as sort of outside the, the, the self. And ultimately, I think that that really has to do with love. And just the way that I, I know from my own experience that you can have joy in the midst of agony emotional agony, even physical challenges, that there's something that is joyful about consciousness itself. I think that there is that kind of love, even in relations with difficult (laughs) people or difficult situations. I'm not there, you know, I can't not hate a lot of the forces that are at work now, you know, they make me angry. But anytime I I feel myself kind of closing up too much, or, or building the walls of the bubble. There's this very strong, no, 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 keep it open, keep it open, keep leaning out, brush off the antenna. You never know what messages are coming through. And though I don't always think about it that way, I, I really appreciate your question for this, in that if I boil down what that attitude is, it is something like love. It is something like that openness to, to the outside. Absolutely, man. And thank you for tackling that I know we went a little longer than we had planned, but I really do appreciate that. To Miguel and Jeff, thank you both for being here as well. You added such a a rich layer of, uh, I I don't know, gnosis to this conversation, I suppose. So uh, I'm very grateful to all three of you for taking as much time as you guys did to hear. Yeah, I just just want to say all you guys, Miguel, Jeff, Ryan, this this was great. I feel really, really honored and blessed to to have this. And, you know, Jeff, I was... You know, I'll see you on Twitter, man. And, you know, Miguel, like really felt a connection to to you for a long time and what what you continue to do. And you're an example of the kind of things that I'm talking about. You know, Ryan, hey, you like put this together. It's great. You know, and I, I really appreciate this work. I think podcasting is extremely important right now. I think it's really key to keep conversations real and to model the connection between people and and ask difficult questions and be be okay not knowing answers and stumbling about and being funny and I think it's really part of what keeps uh you know keeps keeps the the, the good forces going at least in my uh, corner so thanks a lot guys thank you truly enjoyed it I of course admire the work everyone here is doing and uh, let's keep uh, raging against the machine buy a coloring book that's my only advice today. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Upside down and inside out, we just showed all you folks what it's all about. My thanks again to Eric Davis, Miguel Connor, and Jeff Wolf for kicking that flow. That's a hell of a tag team there, and one that we may have to get back again when Eric releases his new book, High Weirdness, next year. Couple things I really liked about this chat. First, Eric's point that the new underground isn't necessarily something to do with a community of people. It's not something like abstaining from social media or the greater internet of things. It's not going off the grid even. It's simply going within yourself. I feel like a broken record because I talk about this all the time and we're only 68 episodes into this story, but goddamn, this is real shit. This is the truth, man. This is your truth. Go within yourself. That's where the real countercultural revolution needs to take place. 
I also liked Eric's point about being an analog person interested in the digital. That resonated with me too. I feel the same way on some level, although I'm not sure if I'm that interested in the digital anymore. I think I'm sort of over it. Those of you who are Rune Supers out there hear Gordon White talk often about your future being analog, and that's true. If you're a magician or an artist, your future is absolutely analog. Hey, those of you out there who use Instagram, have you seen this new story filter for videos on there that makes it look like an old VHS tape with the words at the bottom and that sort of wavy glitch effect? I mean, for fuck's sake, that's an old school analog feature and there's something so aesthetically pleasing about it. And you know the millennials and the Gen Z types on Instagram are getting such a kick out of it, which isn't surprising because analog is cool as fuck. The vinyl record resurgence in the past 15 years and the retro video gaming trend, I mean, this speaks to that same aesthetic attraction. It's built into us. It's part of us. It's definitely part of me. I sat here a couple days ago and made a list of some things I wanted to make for my patrons to give away to them on Patreon, and at the top of the list were things like vinyl records with exclusive interviews on them and cassette tapes and a whole bunch of other tangible items and tangible experiences. And I didn't realize it until just now when I was thinking about what to say to wrap up this episode that the entire list that I made was completely analog and it made me a bit sad that there are people alive on this planet right now who, for example, love music but have never held an album or a cassette tape or even a CD. They never had to record a song from the radio onto a tape so they could listen to it on their Walkman. And some of you might think that's silly now. I mean, why would someone want to go back to that? But I'll tell you why. Because when you have an analog experience like that, you don't take it for granted. That tape could wear out. That CD could get scratched. That record needle could break at any moment. You take care of the experience. You guard it. You're awfully picky about who you let touch it and hold it and borrow it because you have to make sure they treat that experience the same way you do. And as magical as you may think the digital is, and I guess it is magical on some level, but as magical as you think the digital is, there is something infinitely more magical about that analog experience. And that's why I enjoy guys like Eric and Miguel and Jeff, because they get it. Their work has found the underground sound, and it's amazing, outstanding, demanding, commanding. For fuck's sake, Jeff makes a zine every so often, and it's awesome, and I've told him a couple of times he needs to do more with that because I personally would love to own them or help distribute them in some way, because that's the experience I want. And this is not pining over nostalgia. I don't want to trade tapes of obscure horror films from the 70s. I want to trade tapes of obscure horror films from 2017. I want to experience art that's being made now in that way. I don't want to experience Instagram memes, although I am guilty of that. I don't know. I guess what I'm saying is I just want to take it back to the old school because I'm an old fool who's so cool. And speaking of so cool, let's do a little listener giveaway now in honor of the analog and in honor of the 20th anniversary of Eric's book, Technosis. If you made it this far in this episode, you heard me in the intro and just now in the outro, dropping in lyrics from a famous hip-hop song released in the early 90s. If you know what the song is, if you picked up on it, go on Twitter, tag the show, at OculturePod, use the hashtag OG, that's short for Occulture Giveaway, and include the name of the artist and the name of the song in your tweet. First person to do that, you'll win a copy of Eric's Technosis, Myth, Magic, and Mysticism in the Age of Information. The book is valued at around 22 bucks plus shipping on IndieBound, so a nice little gift for anyone who wants it. And speaking of gifts, my thanks to Niles Heckman for a recent one-time donation of $50. Niles is actually going to be a guest on the show here soon, so hit subscribe and come back for that because there's three to four hours of great content there. And also a huge thank you to Jason, who is our newest patron on Patreon, and also our newest executive producer because he's supporting the show at the $20 a month level. He joins our other EPs, Eric and Mike. And that $20 a month level, by the way, is the level you get all the rewards at, including opportunities to co-host episodes with me. I already know Jason has some interest in chatting with some of our upcoming guests, and if you want to see who's going to be on the show and also have a chance to chat directly with them, sign up to be a patron at patreon.com slash occulture. That's linked in the show notes. You don't have to support at $20. Rewards start at just $2 a month. I should also note that our first set of t-shirts are almost sold out. It's a black tri-blend shirt that features the logo of the show with the gray handwritten font underneath it. It was printed with eco-friendly ink and with environmentally safe printing methods. It's soft, it's comfortable, you'll never want to take it off, and it's only $24.99. So if you want one before they're gone for good, hit up oculturepodcast.com slash merch or etsy.com slash shop slash oculturepodcast. Both of those are linked in the show notes. 
And I say they're almost sold out because I plan on introducing more limited edition designs instead of having just static shirts always available. Maybe if the show gets bigger and more popular, we'll have a static list of shirts to choose from, but I really like the idea of exclusive items for people who are really interested in owning them as opposed to just mass-produced items. That exclusivity allows me to create higher quality items as well, you know, better fabrics, better inks. I've been looking at sourcing some organic fabrics, cotton, bamboo, and hemp, and they're not cheap, so low print runs make more sense for me right now. Once we sell out of this first batch of shirts, we'll introduce a new design, but for now, go grab the black tee featuring the show's logo before they're gone. I only have about 10 shirts left. Again, oculturepodcast.com slash merch or etsy.com slash shop slash oculturepodcast. And one more thing before I go, another five-star review came in on iTunes from a user named Chomping It, and all it said was, more Nazi daemon summoning, please. I don't know if summoning Nazi daemons was ever something discussed on the show here, and if it was, it probably won't be again. This podcast has become a bit of an egregore, and the story it's telling has nothing to do with Nazis. Now daemons, well, keep that dial tuned to 528 AM, where the call letters are LTQ, and where I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.